Hey, Internets, it's Jake from Mini Terrain Domain, and this is Dawnbringers, The Ghosts of Saltmar, Season 3, Episode Number 25. Something I've entitled The Sword and the Bow, as for reasons we will see soon. Uh, once again, we are down our, um, our DM Scotty, um, and not our DM, but that's his name, DM Scotty. Uh, and we are also down our clockwork wizard, uh, M, um, who is unable, uh, to join us, um, due to a flat tire. So hopefully they will, um, get that, uh, taken care of, um, in time to make it. If not, we will miss them. Um, head over to at dice on ice on Twitter and let them know that you missed them during the game. Um, but uh you may notice that where scotty usually sits uh we've got a special guest joining us tonight we are very excited to have kai joining us um in a very special role thank you kai for being with us this is actually technically your second time um on mini terrain domain uh, kai was one of my players in the eberron game uh that I ran on Satine, for Satine Phoenix's charity um, a couple months back. Um, and that was our first time playing together. Yep. Um, after which I said, we got to get you on uh, for something. And of course, the Dawnbringers was the one that made the most sense. Um, Yay. I am vamping. Actually, real quick, because I'm trying to make a correction. There is an error on the overlay that I would like to fix. V, why don't you, because I usually do this at the end of the stream, why don't you tell us about the project you got going on with Unmade Gaming? Oh, that old thing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's a new podcast. It's called Dark Fortunes. It's a Humblewood setting, except we've given it a nice little pirate theme. And uh, it's a lot of fun. It is myself. It is Mike from Unmade Gaming, as well as one of Dan's players on Tuesday nights over at World Train Birds. It is McLoken. Mm. He is another player, as is author Rory. And we are all DM'd by the talented video store video so i always screw up his name video store cowboy on twitter uh so it comes out every monday morning and episode five comes out this week and it's gonna be an interesting one and i get to play a vulpin fighter her name is shauna mcteer and she's a pirate and she's also a captain love so yeah this is gonna be interesting <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm behind a little bit on it but i've listened to the the first couple episodes and it is a phenomenal podcast Thank you. Um, and a very cool project to be a part of. Uh, we're always uh, we're fans of um, un of the un of unmade gaming and everything they do uh, here at Mini Terrain Domain. Um, and of course, with V being a player, we wanted to um, be sure that we promote the wonderful uh, show that they're doing. Um, and it is unique in that it's an an audio only actual play podcast. Um, which I think adds a very cool element of immersion to it. At least yeah. I think so when I'm listening to it. Well, um, especially because they're, you know, they're different. They're not humanoid, like shaped like humans or elves or that type right. of thing. They're <clears throat> anamorphic type of thing. And, um, and you all do a wonderful job of, of introducing us to the world through the storytelling. So I don't feel like I need to read some kind of a primer or something before um so it's yeah it's very very well done be sure to check it out um right off the bat this is a good lead-in to talk about domain dice real quick since tomiko uh just subscribed for 14 months on a 10 month streak tomiko is, is of course one of my uh wonderful friends uh, our wonderful friends. I don't know why I'm claiming her all for my own, <laughs> but, um, but thank you, uh, to Miko. And I'm going to go ahead and throw another domain die up there. If you look up above my head here, the domain dice are a wonderful, uh, tool that we have that allows you, the viewer to have an influence on what happens in the game. That's right. You buy a $5 tip, a 500 bit cheer, a subscription, a resubscription, raids, all those kind of cool things will earn the player's domain dice. And those domain dice can be used to re-roll any D20 roll. You can spend two domain dice and make me the DM re-roll. Three domain dice allows you to access hit dice outside of a rest. Four domain dice 
turns a failed death saving throw into a successful one. Unless it's a critical failure, that's going to cost you eight domain dice to undo. And then for five domain dice, it's the patron's blessing. You can turn any hit into an auto crit. Dealing automatic two times max damage. Jeremy is showing off his hammered eye shirt in which he did use a patron's blessing super critical while using a improvised ham bone weapon uh, in this campaign. So that's what the domain dice are all about. Of course, if you want to get a hold of your very own ham or die shirt, you can do so at the merch link that's in the chat. And I think it pops up periodically. A um, couple other real quick announcements. Uh, down in the lower right hand corner, you will see the D&D Beyond logo. That is because D&D Beyond powers mini terrain domain dnd beyond has granted us insider access which means i can run all of the dnd campaigns using dnd beyond and you can mouse over the stream at any time and see the characters pop up and uh find out what they're playing how many hit points they have left all of that cool stuff uh down on the left hand corner you'll see an icon for jasper's game day an initiative coffee company <clears throat> excuse me jasper's game day is an absolutely awesome uh, organization uh, that was started right here in my home state of Michigan by Fenway the Teen DM. Um, the reason the charity started was sad, but she's turning this tragedy into a wonderful thing. Um, named for a friend of hers who took his own life, Jasper. Uh, Jasper's game day is dedicated to raising awareness um, and funding crisis centers around uh, suicide. Uh, through Tabletop Gaming. Um, their flagship event is taking place on May 2nd in Lake Orion, Michigan. Tickets are on sale. You can go to Jasper's Gay, jaspersgameday.com um, or you can look on Facebook. Uh, they have Jasper's Game Day and then Michigan, but they have them in other states too. But the one on May 2nd, they've got seats open. I'm going to be a guest there. Satine Phoenix is going to be a guest there. Um, and they just announced this past weekend Patrick Rothfuss is going to be at Jasper's game day. And there's a chance I might to either get, get to play in a game with Patrick Rothfuss or I want to get to dungeon master for him. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, but you could be a part of that if you uh, want to join us there. Um, but it's gonna be a lot of fun. I'm going to be running my tomb of the mummy Lord in a, a newer adventure that I'm working on called the liberation of the evangeline. Uh, that's right. The Evangeline makes its makes its uh, uh, appearance in more than just the Dawnbringers. Um, so, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, anyway, that link, uh, if you donate through that link, money that money goes to help fund crisis centers around the country. Um, if you would like to donate in another way, you can check out this link at Initiative Coffee Company as part of their help action. I have teamed up with them to create Mitte Roast Coffee, a wonderful blend of Brazilian and Peruvian uh, coffees, uh, beans. Um, I know my coffee lingo. All I know is I put it in hot water and it tastes awesome and it gives me energy. Um, but for every 12 ounce bag of Meta de Rose coffee that you purchase, $3 goes to benefit Jasper's game day and the aforementioned crisis centers. Um, and so finally, while we're on that topic, this is the one message that you will hear every single time. And I will never stop telling you this. You matter. You are important. Whether or not you believe this, you belong on this earth and your presence makes a difference um but we understand that that can be difficult to accept sometimes and that you need to find somebody to talk to um and we really encourage you to reach out and use the resources that we're providing um or rather the links to the resources that are already provided by trained professionals um so and that is why at any time during any mini terrain domain stream uh, you can simply type in the words exclamation point help and this following information will appear. It is also streaming, uh, scrolling across the bottom of the stream continually. Um, and 
those are some excellent phone numbers and text numbers and other resources you can use. If you are in the United States, you can call 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. If you are a veteran, you can press the number one after that and you will be connected with a veteran specialized counselor. If you would prefer, you can dial seven four or text 741-741. In Canada, you can reach the crisis text line by texting the word connect for English or parlay for French to the uh, number is 686-868. Um, or you can call the Canada Suicide Prevention Services in French or English toll-free 24 hours a day, seven days a week at 1-833-456-4566. And of course, if you are among our many friends around the world, you can use the hyperlink or go to open counseling.com slash suicide dash hotlines and there are numerous phone numbers and text numbers available there please if you find yourself struggling use these numbers reach out get the help you need because you matter all right i think it's time to play some dungeons and dragons so here we are it's episode 25 of season three of the Dawnbringers, Ghosts of Saltmarsh. Since landing in Saltmarsh, now it's <laughs> it's interesting to point out that in these 25 sessions, which has taken place over roughly a week of in-game time, um, that's it. <laughs> we've been playing, uh, how long have we been playing this season? For uh, like six months, I think, something like that. Uh, four, I don't know, math. Um, it'd be longer than that because we've had down weeks too. Uh, but yeah, it's been less than, than, uh, one Faerunian week, less than 10 days in game, uh, that they've been in town and already the entire town pretty much hates them. Hundreds of people have died, um, that they've been blamed for. Um, they met a dragon who became their patron, um, they met a Goliath warlock who has recently joined up with them. Uh, Griveth had his uh, soul cleansed. Um, and uh, Fig found a uh, found out a lot about himself. Um, oh, you know what? You're right. Hold on. I updated the wrong one. Um, anyway, I will fix that because the overlay is all screwy. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Uh, let's see what else happened. Um, in Fig finding her, his uh, sister, essentially, uh, figure three Archimedes, um, what happened with that was actually Archimedes kind of found the Dawnbringers and found um fig in the process uh as they were the um captain of the dreadnought a uh ironclad warship that uh well it was mounted chained to the back of a dragon turtle uh crewed entirely by automatons uh, where it showed up in town and began attacking. Uh, the Dawnbringers made quick work of the Dragon Turtle, um, and Fig uh, pretty much almost single-handedly took out uh, Archimedes in a battle of wits uh, that ended with Fig absorbing um, Archimedes' uh, brain, essentially, into his own uh, head. Um Upon being asked by the new council to leave town uh, while they sort through all the problems, um, many of the Dawnbringers, in particular uh, Thorgarn, were very disgruntled um, by uh, the treatment that they had received since arriving here. And uh, they did um, head back to the to the refugee house with, with uh, some 
40 new refugees in tow and um started to kind of just some of them were stewing in their own juices starting to figure out what they were going to do when they began to be attacked by an entity um that became known as the memory thief um that had seemingly possessed some of the um previous uh some of the previous um refugees um and they i'm like doing three things at once and i'm trying to vamp while doing the <laughs> doing the recap so i hesitate sorry for the hesitation um i lost my train of thought uh anyway uh taking over the refugees uh they wound up uh escaping the house taking a long rest recuperating going back in and thanks to drowns quick thinking grabbing one of the tendrils they were able to track it back to its point of origin and destroy the dream thief three of the original refugees uh did die in the process um and uh that was determined however that it was due to uh primarily to the psychic attacks um from the dream thief and not due to uh the numerous attacks that the dawnbringers had put on the uh or memory thief not dream thief um <clears throat> the refugees barlin vagrant and montre were the ones that had passed away and that's where we are going to pick this up is after a um a ceremony has already taken place um out in the back field uh where once there was a hallucinatory terrain uh, of a lake, um, there is uh, now three graves uh, laid out back there. Um, so we're going to pick up after this, sort of as everybody's kind of, all of these new refugees, some 50 of them now, are sort of um, starting to break break away and begin heading toward the house. Um. Dawnbringers, what do you want to do? So, there's been a lot of people in this house. Is there room for all of them here? Uh, yes. Um, it's going to be cramped at first, uh, but they've already got plans to um, work at expanding. Not everybody's going to stay there. Uh, as you remember, um, that when uh captain dervish and um uh manistrad um came they said that there would be work in the rebuilding uh they right. would be able to find work for some of them and some of them are already talking about moving into the town proper the town doesn't have any issue with the refugees it's just specifically the dawnbringers right exactly What about the rest of you? So, uh, Drown probably has no interest or real place at the uh, the ceremonies that are being conducted. So he keeps himself apart from that. And once all of that's done, he'll uh, just sort of whoever's around will turn to turn to them and ask. There was talk of traveling across the sea. Is that right? Oh, sure. Remind me of that one, why don't you? Fortunately. Is that not your next step? Well, yes, but it's just, you know, a few more things thrown into the fire, if you will. Hmm. Matt, we do have to worry about Talmud. I have to do something to get him across the sea. Have you tried hypnosis? Hip what? Hypnosis to help with the seasickness. I don't understand what uh, that means. Well, you know, I was, like you're uh, getting very sleepy, except you're getting very not pukey. I was thinking about starting a uh, a project. Maybe if I can get your mind on something, not worrying about the sea. Maybe that's a 
an option? Maybe, especially if putting my mind on something means Kyrgyz. So what do you think about the two of us starting our own brew? You mean make the yeah. stuff? I know how. I just haven't really. I? Are you any good at it? I've made a handful of things here and there before uh, I left home. But... Well, how about we make some, then we drink it, and I'll let you know if it's a good idea or not. Is that, uh, you think that'll be a good enough plan to keep you thinking about something? Oh, I heard maybe, I hope. It'll at least keep him pickled enough so he won't know what's going on around him. I think it's a great idea, Thorgarn. How far across the ocean? What's your what destination? Far? It was supposed to be, what, a month last time? Only oh. took two days. Hmm. I suppose it might be ready by the time we arrive then. It was about, it was supposed to be about a 10, <clears throat> 10 to 14 10 day journey based on the weather. Oh, you made it in about two. Yeah, with our luck, we're going to hit a hurricane. So, you know, months <laughs> probably more on. <laughs> yeah, you won't have access to the full magical travel this time. Right. right. Well, we could always there's... wait until that's ready again. Do you really think they want us sticking around here much longer? I don't really care what they want, truthfully. What is it that draws you across the ocean? There's some things we need to make right. Hmm. Bit of a uh, family matter, if I uh, got the information correct, Cantrail? Surprisingly, as Vantage told me, yes. Though when I went into this, I had no idea there was actually a solid connection between the two. Which is going to make things interesting. Well, we, uh, we consider the, you know, the members of Dawnbringers our family, and if you've got a family issues and the rest of us have a family issue. I'm not going to ask you to walk into something that may not be exactly easy to attain. Well, we get some information first. Probably for the best. Anything worthwhile isn't easy. Oh, this will not be easy at all. You know, expect the worst, hope for the best. But, hmm. you know, expect the worst plan as best as able come up with a second plan when the first one goes awry second plan is make sure that another freaking seed is not picked up you keep mentioning these seeds <laughs> something about a tree yes griffith got it in his idea somehow and she shoots this look over to talmud ah, that makes sense yes <laughs> no. plant a tree win an elf that's not how it works he misunderstood everything i told him you told him to give me a plant. You're an elf. It makes sense. I'm not a druid. You all like vegetables and things that are green. If they're emeralds. So if he, if if she likes things that are green, why didn't you tell her to tell him to paint himself green? Odd. <laughs> It Let's just make one thing straight. Regardless of what that man ever mind. did, he's not my type. Nor will he ever be. The next time he passes out, I can tattoo him green. <laughs> I, I don't think we're trying to you don't need him get green. Griveth and Cantrail no. together drown. No, no, we don't. We aren't. It won't. Fair enough. Although we have to be a little bit more concerned about him now he's got his sword. Hmm. And I imagine Griveth is somewhere in the midst of, there's probably a half a dozen or so of the refugees that are listening intently as he's telling them of Eldath. And he's, he's not, he's not doing it in a full on um, preachy way, though he is preaching at them. Uh, it's more, he's sitting on a, um, I would say he's kind of sitting on the back porch and they're around sitting around him and uh um he is a little bit more subdued he's at least being conscientious of the fact that there was just a funeral 
but you do see the hilt of the Dawnbringer attached to his belt right next to uh, his other prominent sword, Sir Brafford's Honor, as Cantriel draws attention to this. If they're in earshot a little bit, Drown will be occasionally listening in to what he's telling them about Eldath, but the entire concept of a water deity that is about peace uh, absolutely perplexes him. And Eldath, or rather Griveth, focuses a lot on the waterfall aspect, showcasing he has this shield that magically is emblazoned with uh, the waterfall of Eldath, that as the shield moves, it looks as though the waterfall is actually cascading on the front of the shield. Um, and a couple of, of, of them, the refugees, are really in awe of, you know, reaching out and kind of touching the front of the shield and um griveth does seem a little too fixated on the beauty of eldath and less on her works um as is his nature um <laughs> sorry Drown, did you, you say me? something <laughs> i chortled <laughs> are you are you making an obvious uh you know effort to hide your eavesdropping or no no, I mean he's not—he's not eavesdropping. He's just overhearing, right? They're in earshot, and okay. something will occasionally yeah. catch his attention. He'll sort of lose track of the conversation around him, listen for a while, furrow his brow, and just kind of shake his head. <clears throat> and that'll just you know happen every now and then. So, uh, is there drown? Is there something about uh, Eldath you don't particularly care for? It's not so much that I don't care for her. Uh, I'm certain she's very powerful. I don't understand how she can be what Griveth claims. Griveth claims many things that aren't exactly on the mark. Are you a student of religion at all? No, but, but I know the nature of the sea and the water, and it is not peaceful. depends upon how you look at it i mean i'm not you know i'm not a follower of eldath but i've definitely been touched when uh eldath and um moradin actually spoke to grimith and i uh it was definitely enlightening unnerving it was it's a pretty amazing experience. Moradin makes sense to me. Stone and metal are strong and very real. Uh, Moradin's teachings seem to be like stone and metal, shaped and functional. Well, if you ever wish water, to. Water is not peaceful, it is destructive, I hear that. it is hungry. It is an emptiness that can never be sated, and it tries at all times to swallow everything around it and within it. You know, I think I'm starting to understand you, Drown. It will eventually succeed. <laughs> so I'm looking back and forth between <laughs> Drown and Talmud, and I'm just seeing Talmud's eyes get bigger and bigger. <laughs> it all makes sense. There will come a day when all of this will be under the ocean. You know, just sort of look around at the, the the surrounding countryside. And now Talmud looks terrified. And as you say that, Drown, there's it's sort of punctuated by um, a particularly wa- large wave crashing against the uh, the shore down the bluff. And you get that on the breeze. You catch a stronger whiff of the salt sea air. Drown takes kind of a a deep breath at that and just sort of lets it wash over him. Um, He doesn't necessarily look happy or refreshed about it. It just sort of is. There's an audio on my shoulder. (laughs) (laughs) I I have the same one over there. (laughs) Oh, there's an audio. Roll for initiative then. (laughs) 
You guys just no. took on a memory thief. I think an Otiug would be no problem. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a whispering Otiug. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Stop it! I didn't whisper. I didn't whisper. Uh, Drown, as you're listening, I, I would imagine this does less to... Um, to alleviate your thoughts or concern and more emphasizes your thoughts and concern as you're trying to reconcile Eldath is Griveth talks of waterfalls, of spring pools, the stillness and the peace, the meditation uh, that comes. Um, though never focusing on the violent nature of the waterfall itself. It's always the pool and the beauty of the Lady Eldath and how and how she grants him healing magics and the ability to smite his enemies. And there's a little bit of, of Griveth kind of showing what, um, more so what Eldath can do for him, um, but also how she, she works through him. So Drown at one point just says, ah, Eldath is a trickster. That makes more sense. You know, that's not exactly that uh, off of a theory. I, I really don't think that Eldath is a trickster. Uh, she is convinced I, Griffith only to see one tiny fragment of water's place in the world. Right. I'm well, not in a, fair, fairness, uh, Griffith only sees what he wants to see and interpret what he wants to interpret. And so, perhaps he's the perfect servant of Eldath. I don't study all of the religions. I mean, most of my, my teachings is you know, gone into you know where I particularly uh, favor you know, Moradin, but most of the time, you know, gods tend to have this idea, ideal, and when they put these you know monikers or symbols on things, they don't always fit. I think it's more about you know peace and healing. And the waterfall has a calming effect to many people. I'm um, just spitballing here. I don't really know exactly. You know, you can, you know, quiz Griveth if you really want to. But I have no desire. That that aspect is more of what I feel is in there, and it's not about all aspects of water. If that makes sense. I don't deny that Eldath has power. And I'm certain their power is great. I just don't fully understand. But I don't have to. I don't bother with the gods. They're too uh, mercurial. That is a Talma reasonable just, position to take. Talma just kind of looks at Cantriel and raises his eyebrow. What? I know I'm not exactly the most stable-minded person at times. I just didn't figure you'd hold something like that against somebody. Well, when they so how long before people... uh, how long before we want to actually get aboard ship and high tail? You can take it. your time. Take your time. There's no <laughs> rush. Nope. There's no rush. Take your time. Everything's good. Nope. We're fine. She makes sense. So uh, I'll pull Talma aside, and you know we can just begin. Uh, and I'll basically begin kind of like asking him questions about the different types of things that we might begin to do. And then I want to see if I could hire uh, a refugee or three to go into town and pick up the supplies. Is that doable there, Mr. DM? Uh, yeah. So are you going to set up a brewing, like brewing still on the ship? Yes. Cool. Um, yeah, you absolutely can do that. There's a moment where, as you're doing this, uh, you and you guys are having this conversation. Um, you hear and see as Hermes goes running by, and following close behind is uh, um, is Fake. Fig calling Hermes, Hermes, Hermes. Doop, 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 this this is also why we need more time. <laughs> and Fig stops at one point, just looks at all of you and says, 
Training Hermes is going surprisingly well. Hermes! Thumbs up! If you have kids, this is totally hysterical. <laughs> so accurate. You're doing this, great. This all checks out. <laughs> so terrifyingly so. Also, I I have to call out our friend Spike, who yes. uh, oh after yes. being gone for a while, just came in, dropped a thousand bits for two domain dice, and then just dropped ten gift subscriptions on the chat. So ten of you oh. uh, in chat have just been benefited uh, by. That's what all those notifications were. Um, which means uh, that is another 10 domain dice on top of the 112. You have 122. Thank you for showing wow. the domain some love there, Spike. We've missed you. Thank you, Spike. Um, to the family. And thank you to everybody else who's been subscribing and, and, and uh, dropping uh, bits. We'll be sure to call them out later in the stream. Uh, but I have been noting them and awarding. Thorgarn, um, yes, you are able to find some of the refugees that uh, w one of them, um, a middle-aged uh, half-elven man, um, tells you that uh, he, and, he and a couple of the, the others were looking to head into town to see what they could do to help out, um, and they'd be glad to uh, run the errand for you um, to... Uh, run into town, get whatever supplies you need. Um, though he says, I suspect it's going to be, it could be troublesome trying to get our supplies while the, while the town is in disrepair, but, uh, I'll ask around to see, and, and I'm really sorry to have to ask this up front, sir, but, uh, as you know, in our current state, I have no coin uh, oh, I'll, to I'll purchase pay. a head for you. I'll pay and pay handsomely. That's not a problem. Um, well, that's that's very kind of you, sir. We're very happy uh, to do this for you, and we're going to, as we're heading in town and looking for work, uh, but we'll head back We'll head back here with your supplies, and why don't you put together a, a, a list, um, whatever else you might need, and uh provide the coinage for that and i'll be sure to pick it all up and bring it back so uh you know i'll call out to uh, the rest of the dawn bringers see if anybody else is looking for anything in particular that you know since we're not really welcome in there might as well uh get all the shopping done all at once and i'll say at the risk of um or not the risk but in the interest of dodging a shopping episode uh off air if you all would like uh you can put together a list of mundane or any other equipment you would like i know you guys have plenty of coin to cover it and i'll let you know what that's going to cost and then uh we'll take care of that cool uh but that's they end up sending about a half a dozen of them um that go into town uh with this mission All right. What else would you like to do? Talmud. Anything in particular that Talmud's getting up to? I I mean, he's absolutely dreading the thought of spending a month on a boat. Um, the two days alone was pretty bad for him. So I imagine he is trying to find anything and everything he can do to busy himself to try to keep his mind off of the fact that this is going to happen, whether he likes it or not. So if there's repairs that still need to be done to the house, if they're starting on any of the um, expansion projects, he'll, uh, he may even like spearhead some of that stuff. There's definitely plenty of work to be done um, in straightening up, uh, basic repairs they had just sort of gotten started um, there's interior and exterior work uh, you Talmud uh, coming from a stone cutting clan um, would notice that the uh, the chimneys are in disrepair um, from outside and um, you'd there'd be a handful of people um, led by a 
uh, a stout halfling woman uh, with her sleeves rolled up. She's got bushy uh, red hair. And she's got her hands on her hips, and she's holding back a couple of, um, not physically holding them back, but just kind of standing there next to the chimney with her hands up like this to these uh, kind of brawny humans. And she says, Listen, you can't just go in and start pulling stones. If you do this, that whole thing's going to come down. You don't need to show off with your muscles. I know you can move heavy stuff. All right? We're going to need to take a look at everything before we just start pulling stuff apart. And that's about the time you come walking up. And she looks over at you. And don't tell me you're coming over here to start knocking rocks out with your hammer. No. No. Not at all. It kind of moves Gerta back onto his back. I was coming over to say that they really ought to listen to you. You sound obviously like you know what you're talking about. I was coming to see if maybe I could lend a hand in whatever needs to be done. She looks up at the two humans. This is how you go about doing work. You figure out who's in charge and you acquiesce to them. All right, listen, and she starts setting out some orders, and and uh, she had starts a sort of a dialogue with you, and and kind of recognizing you as a dwarf. You know, I don't want to assume that uh, you know you know stone just because you're a dwarf, but uh, any expertise you got would be very helpful here. I don't know when she became very a new a New York halfling. <laughs> <laughs> That's just sort of happened. <laughs> She's going to get the coffee and the bagels she, with the law she's with, set up and going? She's with the refugees union. <laughs> <laughs> the local 463. Um, Talmud will... Uh, he'll lend his... Whatever knowledge he has about uh, stone cutting that he's gathered from his clan, he'll definitely lend that... Um, no, no, no. We, we need to shore this up. It was built wrong in the first place. I'm surprised that it's been standing this long on its own. Um, you know, things like that. You, oh, no, no, no. We don't want to pull that stone. We want to pull this one next to it. This one's load bearing, um, that kind of stuff. And, uh, but always making sure that he doesn't step on her toes. He wants to make sure that she stays feeling like she's in charge of the situation because, uh, yeah, he doesn't he doesn't want any more issues. So Talmud is keeping himself pretty occupied. Um for a while there, Drown and Thorgarn uh were in a bit of a uh a bit of a theological discussion in Cantriel as well. Um so what are the rest of, of you doing as Thorgarn's busying himself? Or rather Talmud's busying himself with the chimney. Thorgarn's hiring out uh, some runners. Griveth is still uh, proselytizing. Fig is chasing Hermes around. So that leaves Cantriel and Drown. I would absolutely be looking to see if I could find any information whatsoever on ships. Because there's parts to ships and there's things about ships. And I wasn't exactly paying attention on the ride over. Brown is not super helpful in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> there are sides of a ship. Right? There are, yes. Wine and something else. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. There's wine side and something side. It's a drink. One of the uh it's actually the the older gnomish woman that had uh originally when she was under under the the power of the memory thief tried to uh the simulacrum tried to um influence fig um and uh her name is uh you have since learned is madam thela um she just suddenly seems to be there near you cantriel and she says emma it Excuse me. It's um, it's 
It's not wine. It's port. Close enough. That's well, you're in the right idea, remembering it through the idea of a of a drink, but it's the wrong drink. That's port and starboard. So or perhaps you can think of it as port and stout. I like that. Talmud would like it too. Um perhaps. I'm Take it for what it's worth. I'm not much of a sailor myself, but I did pay attention. Uh, you know, when when the people that uh, are holding the whip over you and they yell at you to move to the port side or to the starboard side, you yeah. pay attention. You learn quickly aft and fore, stern yeah, and bow. Yes, that's certainly some incentive. All right, so port and... Starboard. Starboard. What's aft and aft is the back of the boat. Think of it this way: aft and ass. That's a good one. And bow like you bow forward, then. Bow exactly. You get in the hang of it. All right. So port and st- uh, not stout. Starboard. Port bow and to starboard. Aft is to your arse. Aft is to your arse. Bow to the forward. All right. First, then you've got. You've got to learn the forecastle, the stern castle, the mizzen deck, the midden deck, the main mast, the foremast. Can't I just put, like, you know, room numbers on them? <laughs> Wouldn't that work? You know, room one, room two, like they do in hotels. You seem to be a bit distraught about this fact that you're suddenly wearing a captain's hat. It wasn't exactly a career choice that I was anticipating. But didn't he say you'd have a crew and a first mate? That would help you. Yes, but still, if I'm supposed to make choices and direct people in certain places, you know, if I say go wine, they might go and get a couple of pegs of wine instead. Can I ask you this question? Of course. All of these people, the dwarf there, the one helping with the chimney, that dwarf over there, the big giant one with the tattoos, the armored one. Mm-hmm. The metal one and his metal friend. Aren't they all your friends? Did well, I not the, the see them all? On one of them, but yes. Did I not see you all working together when you fought against Archimedes and her crew? You when you wrong. fought the dragon turtle? Yes, we did. You didn't do it all by yourself, did you? No. So why are you worrying about sailing the ship all alone? They're going with you, are they not? Yes, it's just I'm not exactly one to uh, take on titles. A title's just a word. It's just another thing. You don't have to wear it. So they can just call me Cantriel and not Captain Cantriel? Sounds like I should have some sort of breakfast food after me. Well... The fact is, the crew, if you are in the role of the captain, they are going to call you captain, probably. They have a certain decorum they have to maintain. Right. You don't have to like it. Just don't let it have power over you. How do you like sailing? Not much of a fan of it, um, in the capacity with which I've done it. Um, most of it was below decks, jam-packed with all the others. How are you at cooking? I'm a very good cook. That's what they really? did on the on the dreadnoughts for all of the refugees. Well, I, rumor has it I might actually need a cook. Especially a good one. Are you asking and... me to join the crew of your ship? The one yes! that you're reluctant to captain? Well, I mean, if if I know I have a cook, that I can go downstairs and what was it downstairs? What would you call it if you go into the cooking area? Below deck, into the oh, galley. Okay, below deck. All right. So if I go below deck to the gallery. Galley. No R. All right. All right. So go below deck to the galley, and have a competent cook to chat with, especially one of more feminine persuasion. It would be refreshing. I'm a man. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was like, what's up, Jake? Sorry. No, I listened. <laughs> Can't do that. Nope, nope, nope. Um, 
I must admit, I wasn't expecting this. Well, neither was I. I was not sure where my place would be here. But well, I suppose if you'd have me and you have the room. I think we'd have the room, considering we do need the cook. And I can promise you that I'm not exactly one about um, forced labor. Well, that I've learned from all of you. It seems to not be something you took keen on. Not at all. And we're all very grateful. Well, then. I can already see the effect it's had on everybody. I had to take on the role as a sort of matron to everyone while we were in captivity. I can understand that, though I tend to fall more into the crazy aunt category. <laughs> I find I'm that sorry. hard to believe. What, the aunt or the crazy part? The crazy part. We'll ask the others. They might disagree with you. I'm sorry, what was your name again? I'm called Madam Thela. Madam Thela. Some of them had taken to calling me grandmother. I was... I was a bit of a medium prior oh, to I'm captivity. Oh, I'm you even more. Yes, I think you'd be an excellent fit. When I'm small, I don't take up much space. <laughs> she You're sort of g giggles at her own joke. Oh, I'm loving it. Absolutely loving it. Well, then. My first duty as captain is to hire you as cook. How's that? Well, all right, then. Excellent. She kind of leans in just a little conspiratorially, already in a half wink. Very well, then, Captain. Thank you, Madam. <laughs> right, well, that actually felt good. Thank you. All right, I better make a note of this. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, I have a bad habit of doing that. I saw the side chat. I think I don't know who it was said something about can we take her with us? <laughs> like, I gotta make sure this is a voice I can keep doing. All right. That's why I told you that's why I wrote all the names you. down ages ago for all the refugees. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. So Candriel has hired a new cook. Um, so the day gets on. People begin busying themselves or continue to busy themselves, um, throughout the day. Um, Thorgarn, you don't expect the, the ones you sent in the town to return until the next day. Um, so it's not surprising when they don't come back that evening. Um, but as it moves on towards, uh, Somewhere in the midday, um, some of the a handful of the men and women, um, led by Madame Thela, have put together a um, a lunch that is uh, fresh break fresh baked breads and a stew. Um, they had quickly set up a um, cooking tripod and and stew pot over one the one bonfire uh, that had been left. Let it die down a bit and turned it into a cooking fire. And, uh, so food is served midday and then around evening, everybody just starts to set up. Um, it's warmer than it's been and people are a bit skittish about being inside the house. You've noticed all throughout the day. Uh, they know that they're going to have to go in there eventually. Um, but there seems to just be this decision that hey we're going to eat outside and so all the trestles are brought outside uh the the any crates that weren't used to repair the broken floor um are brought out uh all of the um food is had had been inventoried and so things are prepared and um a meal is set up there's a handful of fires nearby so uh, everything is illuminated in firelight and um, it's a much more subdued atmosphere um, from the uh, the night before 
as um, people still are very aware that only a couple hundred yards away are the the gravestones of the three that passed. So, you know, with the, the majority of the day to do kind of whatever, um, with us going to be getting out of here in the, you know, probably nearest future, um, I would have you know, done whatever I'm able to uh, you know, help prepare the house, you know, you know, with with whoever is willing to go inside, or you know, if it's just if it's just me, it's just me, whatever. Um, but whatever needs doing, I'll gladly lend a hand. <clears throat> Somewhere, as the meal is being served, and or has been served, and food is being. Uh, consumed uh, people are are talking quietly there's a little bit of laughter um, you find once again Cantriel uh, that Madame Thela is alongside you and uh, she just comes up alongside you with a pitcher um, and refills your glass your your goblet and says she just sort of gives a nod with her head and you realize she's kind of motioning in the direction of Griveth across the table and down a little ways question about that one not a question an observation do you share he's very passionate about Eldath. And it, it's not a bad thing, but I fear that he almost seems to be overcompensating. <laughs> and I didn't mean it in that way. Uh, well, I've had my own theories, actually, so, you know. He seems to be overcompensating for something in his past most likely I can sense that though Eldath truly seems to be favoring him you can see it in his aura is it in a good way or a bad way That's, it's good that's good but there's still a shadow that hangs around him. You don't smell death on him, do you? I don't smell death. But it's a shadow that lingers around like a stray pup that you've given a few scraps to and then you stop feeding it and it still lingers nearby hoping that there could be scraps there. And then the concern becomes if it's going to start nipping at your heels to get attention. Perhaps. Maybe it's nothing and it's not my place, but I have a bit of the vision. That's what I see. That's very good to know. What's your vibe about that sword of his? The long one that he wears at his waist he calls Sir Bradford? No, not that one. That one I know where he got it from. The other one. Ah, uh, the one that's just a hilt? I can see it's magical aura. I don't know much about that sword in particular. But I know that that sword has an intelligence to it. I don't know what about it. I can just sense it. Hmm. Well, it'd be interesting to get that sword to do a little talking, perhaps. Well, I would imagine if it is truly an intelligent sword that Griveth is able to talk to it. Hmm. Well, 
I think I might go over and um, introduce my bow to that sword. I Mother and I were talking about having her have a friend for tea. Two sentient weapons seems like a rather uh, kismet match. Your bow also has an intelligence. It has my mother. Well, now there's a story that perhaps someday you could tell in full. But I sense it to be a long and deep story. No, that absolutely is. I'd say uh, perhaps one day below deck in the galley. How'd I do? She smiles. Perhaps. You wish, probably... you wish to have your swords, or your bows, your, your mother, you see, mm -hmm. talk to Grevy's sword. I think it'd be interesting. But if that happens, you wouldn't be able to hear what they had to say, speaking no, on a spiritual way. Yes, but I can speak to my mother after. You pardon me, Captain for being so forward, but perhaps there's something I can do to help? Well, I'm always up for extra hands. What do you have in mind? Well, as I told you earlier today, I'm a medium. Right. You want to, I uh... might be able to, with the help of your friends and you, facilitate a communication between your mother you and that seances? sword. That's, it's not a seance per se, but it's not dissimilar either. Spiritual chat. Whatever you want to call it, but. Well, I'm intrigued. I'll need you and your friends. And. Perhaps we could use the room upstairs that had been reserved for you. All right. I'll uh, gather the, well, I guess their crew. <laughs> well, I'll gather them and uh, you want to do this now or at a certain time? She looks up at the stars. She turns her gaze and she looks over at the moon that uh is uh risen and um low on the horizon and it's about a half moon any time between now and when the moon is at its zenith will be good gather everyone in the upstairs room right will do <laughs> thank you madam and she gives a nod, sets the pitcher down next to you, and uh, sort of walks off in the direction um, of the house. Okay. And I would uh, catch everyone up on the plans and give them the time when we'd want to meet in the room. And go from there. All right. With that, since it is 9.45 p.m. in the real human world that we live in, <laughs> um, it's close enough to our break time that we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to take our 10-minute break now so we can come back and get right into this uh, uh, medium-facilitated communication and finally give Kai a chance to talk. <laughs> um. But uh, at least Kai sees what she's dealing with, too. Uh, <laughs> I needed the warning. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. You deal with Mama all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure who's worse, Cantriel or Mama. Mm, they might be related. <laughs> Actually, better. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to everybody who has tuned in so far this evening. Uh, lots of new people following the channel. Thank you again to Spike for uh, dropping the bits and for the gifting the community uh, the 10 uh, subs. 
Uh, thank you to Shadow of Dragons who cheered 500 bits and resubscribed. Follow me and die. I missed that. Follow me and die. Sub, you guys, I gotta, I owe you a domain die um, for that. Um, and then Everjay resubscribed. Um, Initiative Coffee Company. I got Tamiko at the top of the stream. Thank you to everybody. Stick around. We are going to be back in 10 minutes. Uh, with the rest of this episode of the Dawnbringers. We will be right back.
we go. I hit the wrong button. I'm like, here we go, and nothing's happening. And we're back. Hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jake. I'm a professional streamer. Uh, um, I hit the wrong button. Instead of hitting the overlay, I hit the break button again. Uh, but we're here now. Um, and we are about to apparently um, have a seance between a sword and a bow. We're going to cut to a little bit later as um, the Dawnbringers have all gathered into this room on the second floor of this house. Um, the room is very clean um, and uh, had a couple of beds in it that had been reserved uh, for the Dawnbringers upon their return. Um, and while they're here, it's a good sized room was probably the master bedroom of this house. Uh, but the beds have all been pushed to the side and the hardwood floor, um, though swept clean, uh, is still a little bit warped and, uh, weathered looking. Um, and, uh, is now illuminated entirely by candles that have been placed around the room in no discernible pattern. Um, Madam Thela has taken a pillow um, and placed it on the ground and is seated there as everybody um, has is seated around. And she tells you it doesn't matter the order in which you are seated, um, though she does ask that uh fig um leave hermes somewhere else so that he's not distracting um and a couple of uh in fact the two brawny humans that were helping talmud and and uh um the halfling woman with the uh chimney um take on the task of of keeping charge of uh, hermes so in this room, we have Cantriel, Talmud, Drown, Thorgarn, Griveth, and uh, Fig seated around in a circle. And Madame Thela asks that you um, place the hilt that is Dawnbringer and the bow that is your mother melody in the center of this circle. As I said to you outside, this is not a, tr a seance in the truest sense. What we are doing here is I am facilitating the communication between this bow and this sword called the Dawnbringer in such a way that through my ability to see into the spiritual world and through us all holding hands, you will all be able to see as these two consciousnesses communicate. There is a an aroma in the room that uh, is a mixture of incenses and a hint of sage and some other herbal scents that uh, put most of you at at ease, uh, feeling very comfortable. Um, unless such a thing uh, makes you nauseous. Uh, in which case you might be a bit nauseous, uh, but it will pass momentarily as you grow used to this. What at first seems like dissonant, different dissonant smells as they begin to mingle into a pleasant aroma. And Madame Thela turns to you. She has on her right side, she has seated Cantriel. And on her left side, she has seated Griffith. And she says, 
Whatever it is that you have to do, dear, summon forth your mother. Uh, all right. Mother, why don't you come out? Really? That's all you do? You just call her? That's all it, you know, it's like she's in the other room. It just happens to be a small bow. It's quite simple. And, (laughs) all right. And, Grivith, dear, concentrate on the Dawnbringer. And as she says this, uh, the hilt begins to glow. And very slowly, you see the shimmering illuminated blade emerge where the sword lies across the floor next to the bow. The shadow that is cast from the light of the Dawnbringer sword be lying next to this bow, it sort of causes the shadow of the bow to dance up across the ceiling and compete with the flickering candlelights a little bit. And what looks like four or five shadows of this bow sort of coalesce and from the shadows at the edges of the room steps the form the shadow form of melody kentriel's mother and she looks around and then she glances over at the sword lying on the ground oh this this is interesting And with no hesitation, she reaches down and she picks up Dawnbringer. As she does so, there is a a flare and a flash of light. And you are all momentarily blinded with a white light. Kai, what scene emerges fading from this white vision what scene do we all see with Dawnbringer being unexpectedly summoned into this party um you first are brought into down these like memories with her and you're first brought into this bloody battle and you can hear the screams of men and horses and the whistle of arrows and the cracks of magic like thundering behind you and the singing of iron on iron And you don't feel pain with her, but you with her feel the warmth of blood pooling near her armpit and down the side of her armor. And you can see it dripping from the iron um, and starting to stain the padding underneath. And she falls to her knees and her line of vision goes to her hand and out um, from her outstretched hand on the ground, you can see um, the sword and it's this hilt um, with the rest of the sword on it um and her hand and the sword are covered with dirt and the herbal smell that you smell is replaced with this rotting hot blood smell and you can just see her hand kind of lose life in this blood spattered um grass and darkness creeps in and it creeps in around all of you all of you guys feel this darkness creeping in and you don't know how long it's been and it feels like an eternity and then when you start to like feel that the darkness is cold and it's feeling all of your souls like like a tomb like a death tomb and um you you feel silence and it's not a typical silence that you enjoy it's a silence that starts to rip your soul apart and fragment pieces of your soul away um, from the underdark And you can tell that she's spent a lot of time in the Underdark alone and cold and centuries have gone by and it's weighted and it's emotionless. And as you feel her soul cracking, she starts to scream because she wants to feel something other than emotionless. And she starts clawing at her neck and clawing at her arms, just trying to feel pain, trying to feel anything. And she's screaming out. And finally, she starts to force the darkness away from her and force the darkness out of her mind. And as she does that, you guys also see the vision kind of 
fading away from dark, hazy, and then coming into clearness. And she's laying in grass again, and your vision pans out to her hand in the same place it was from the battlefield. But this time it's soft and delicate. There's no armor. And that hilt of the sword is out in front of her hand, and it's clean. And she reaches out and touches it, and it's warm to the touch. Um, and it's glowing like a white gold aura around it. And she sits up from this grass and she's wearing this very, very flowy, beautiful dress. And there's, there's willow trees around her and the soft breeze and birds chirping. And your smell goes from like dank caves from the underdark to warm dirt. And you hear the babbling creak and, um, she, she speaks to you. Uh, seeing that you're kind of in this place in her mind. And she says, well, it's not often the men, the mind of men come and visit me. And surprisingly, you hear a woman's voice as an elven woman, Eldrin. steps into your vision. V, in her non-shadow form, what does Melody, the Eladrin woman, look like? Well, when she's in shadow form, she and Cantriel look very much alike in terms of form and height, mannerisms. But when she was in her elven form, living, breathing, where Cantriel's hair is wheat blonde her mother's hair is actually dark as night and her eyes are deep brown whereas cantriels are an unnerving sea green and her skin is a little bit more tanned than cantriels is so it's almost where cantriel is very much brightness and color her mother is more darker tones and muted tones what color is and what style is the clothing that she wears she likes to wear dark blues and purples usually a sash tied around her waist will be a scarlet red very similar to the one that cantriel wears in her hair every so often and in this instance she's wearing what at first looks like it could be a sleeveless dress but you can see that she wears uh, leather um, riding pants and boots underneath as she moves with a confidence of somebody who has, a, she moves with the confidence of a noble. They, they can hear you, but they won't be able to speak to you. I'm going to be their voice tonight you are called Dawnbringer yes that is the name I go by it's been centuries since I've heard my real name the the darkness the coldness the Isolation. That's where you've been. As she says that, you can feel like the cold and the silence kind of like creeping at the edges of this forest in, in her mind. That's where I was, yes. And I imagine as it creeps in, this idyllic scene, uh, it's almost like everybody you can feel this vibration and the image just sort of sort of shudders for a moment as there's this and then it recedes and stabilizes there's there's much fear there am i am i not wrong it's fear, it's darkness, it's cold. But 
this this place here this is warmth this is light why do you let the dark hold so tightly to you I need to remember how it feels in order to not go back to it. This has been most of your existence, this isolation, this separation. Yes, I suppose it's the path that's been chosen for me. Ah, now there is something I can relate to, though, in the scheme of what we are, I am but a babe compared to you. And she reaches out her hand to the, to the sun that's kind of coming down through the, the leaves lazily and across the forest floor, and she says, yes, you are but a babe. But don't fret. The warmth here is good. And it reminds me of the good in the world. Do you remember how you were forged? That was centuries upon centuries ago. That memory eludes me so you're saying eventually it will go away yes eventually you'll you'll forget you'll forget that Eldrin you'll forget everything She turns to stare off into the middle distance, but both you and Cantriel know that she's looking at you, Cantriel. And then she looks back. I'll forget everything. (laughs) You'll remember good and dark, light, evil, but yes, you'll forget the memories that you've made. Were you always, were you always a sword? No, I was once a woman. So you were a spirit forged into a weapon too. Hmm. She seems, and all of you, while you're listening and observing this, you're all experiencing both Dawnbringer's and Melody's emotions secondhand. Um, More so uh, Melody's. Um, You sense that... Melody is sort of like a, a a live wire or an open mic, I guess, for lack of a better term, to uh, with these emotions. Where Dawnbringer seems to have learned how to hold back some of that, and you're only catching fragments of those emotions that are only discernible because of the connection Madame Thela has set up here. Melody sort of shakes her head like she's clearing away uh, an unpleasant thought or perhaps that she was dwelling on her own predicament a little too much. And suddenly that full, confident, noble, Eldrin woman posture is back. You have concerns about the one to whom you have been bound. 
That is why I am here. They want me to talk to you. See what your hesitations are. I do have concerns. It seems that he has been cleansed recently, but he had a great darkness in him. And as as that happens, she knows that there's that line. So she'll lash out the feeling of like the underdark and that like cold, silent, um, like almost like silent torture out at all of them. Like an icy breeze that precedes a cold front moving in. Um, and as even this discussion happens, uh, the mentions of this darkness, you notice that at the fringes of this this pleasant setting, it looks like the uh, the bright sunlight is making the horizon look like dark storm clouds are lurking in the distance. When that uh, when that feeling washes over all of us, drown shivers a little bit, turns his head toward Thorgarn, and says, "That, that's the inevitable end of all water." Thorgarn just kind of like takes it in and gives you gives you a nod. Um, he's definitely thinking about what what you're saying, but. You definitely see that there's some trepidation there. You you are correct. Uh, Griveth was cleansed very recently. For far too long. Though it was only a couple of months. Griveth was tainted with the darkness of a Gothias seed. The Gothias tree. Tree grown from the staked body of a vampire by the same name. When Griveth slew the tree, destroying it, with his other sword that he wears on his hip, the one he calls Sir Bradford's honor. When he destroyed this tree, we learned only recently that he freed the spirit of the vampire. Griveth took with him, unbeknownst to anyone, a single seed from the destroyed tree. And that tree leaked its corruption into him, turned him into a shadow of the person who he is and who he was capable of being. And though the ritual that all of them partook in to cleanse him was successful. That kind of a darkness is, I no doubt don't need to tell you, leaves an indelible mark upon your soul. It leaves its imprint. And that is what you sense. Yes, I do feel that he is free of the corruption. But he made the choice for darkness. Will he make that choice again? And will he try to wield me in his path for destruction? Your concerns are valid. But I've seen Griveth, particularly since his cleansing, acting on the power of Eldath, his sworn, his sworn goddess, 
the goddess of the waterfalls and the still pools. It is she who gives him his power. But he was... He was in service to El Death when he was tainted as well. Yes, I imagine he wants to prove his devotion again. But he's had that taste of blood. And she can kind of taste iron in her mouth as she says that. A single trail of blood involuntarily leaks from the corner of your mouth for a moment. And I I wonder if that power will call to him again. And I, I don't, I can't go back to the darkness. And that, that thunder that you kind of described earlier happens again. It's, it kind of flashes back to where she was going insane and like ripping at her own body for just to feel something. You, you keep going to these memories of this dark place, this loneliness, your desperation to feel what you've done, what you've gone through. I fear if you continue to fixate on that, you may actually show Griveth that taste of darkness. Look, there. And she indicates in this space beyond this vision where you see in your eyes they appear as spectral images of the the tiny gnomish woman with griveth on one side and cantriel on the other and talmud and drown thorgarn the surprisingly bright blue aura coming from the construct fig and you see in the midst of that the the form of melody that exists in the material plane the shadow form holding your sword form illuminated see how brightly you shine in their world You can be I that feel, light. I feel the light in them. And the 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 light kind of becomes a brighter in the world that that the Dawnbringer has created. I just need to know that Griveth his devotion is true. I feel that's going to be something that only Griveth can show you. Through his deeds. Through his actions. Through his heart. And so he shall show us. Will you allow Griveth to wield you to your full potential? Will I? <laughs> I don't know. Am I going to allow him? <laughs> <clears throat> you tell me. I shall give him a little more power. I shall give him a little more light. But he shall not bear the full power of the Dawnbringer. Until he has shown that he is light and not dark. Melody in her eladrin form uncrosses her arms 
sort of smiles at you in a smile that I imagine uh, everyone has seen a hundred times, a sort of sly smile on the face of Cantriel. And then the shadow form of Melody takes a step over in front of Griveth and places the Dawnbringer sword on the ground in front of Griveth. For a moment, as she takes a step away from it, she moves over, taking a couple steps to the side, the shadow form in the material plane, standing in front of Cantriel. And for the briefest moment, Cantriel, all of you having full access to Melody's emotion, you sense a quick sort of uh, very Cantriel-like um, uh, uh, slyness. I can't think of the proper word, but um, and it's a little bit selfish. Sass. As sa- this, there's some <laughs> sass there. Uh, the uh, the Elegant form steps forward and merges, superimposed with the shadow form. And she seems to be struggling to hold this form as she just reaches a hand out and just goes like this, Cantriel, and you feel a single wisp of hair that had fallen loose just get tucked back the way Melody always used to do when she was talking to you. And then you can feel you can all feel that she's struggling to hold this connection to the material plane. She reaches over and with a finger that is both shadow and light, she touches the forehead of Madame Thela and everything goes white for all of you. Dawnbringer. Your connection to the material plane through this amplification is severed, but your illusion, your illusory place that you exist in, and the Eldrin form of melody is still there. Only you, Dawnbringer, hear the following exchange. Griveth is a strong will. He means well. But he also needs a strong hand. You are smart to withhold your full potential. Show him. Don't be afraid to let him know that you control how much of your power you will have access to. He has to earn it. I think even Cantriel, if she were here, and this is why, in part, I severed the connection, she would not necessarily agree with what I'm about to say. But I believe that Griveth has the potential to be the hero he wants to be. But all of them have been scarred by his actions. Perhaps Cantriel the most. Please help Griveth to be the paladin of Eldath the wielder of the Dawnbringer that he can be. Yes. We shall help him along this path. 
and you can feel the the edges of the darkness kind of push back and a little bit more warmth come into this area. The white that all of you are seeing sort of shimmers and this illusory idyllic field returns once again, though the elegant form of Melody and Dawnbringer are shifted slightly. You you know you missed something. The connection was briefly lost. Melody looks at you, Dawnbringer. Madam Thela grows weak. Say whatever you will. This will probably be the last time you'll be able to speak to all of them. And you can say any parting words to the Dawnbringers as a group that you wish. She's going to send out warmth into their souls. Not not visually, but into their souls. You have the power to bring greatness in this world. Don't waste it being foolish and selfish. And it kind of fades out. What does the scene look like as you leave everyone's presence, returning to the actual physical sword of Dawnbringer and only Griveth has a connection with you at that point. You'll see oh, her, oh. her ethereal dress kind of start. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you cut. You cut uh, out you'll for see just her a ethereal, ethereal dress. Can you hear me now? Yes, we okay, got you. Okay, you'll see her ethereal dress kind of start shifting back into that armor that you see you saw earlier kind of preparing to be by their side through this adventure um and she'll kind of stare i feel like stare straight into the soul of griffith griff griveth griveth <laughs> uh and kind of give him a sense that he's not the only one in charge. And all of you catch just a just a hint of that last sense of emotion as the light and the imagery recedes and you're back suddenly aware you can feel the hand of whoever you're holding whoever's hand you're holding next to you you can feel the sort of close warmth of this space with the incense and the burning candles you can smell the burning wax the salt air and then the shadow form of melody turns and looks back at you one more time cantriel and reaches up and moves a shadowy wisp of her own air, hair, tucking it behind her ear. And you hear next to you is Madame Thela. <sighs> and her eyes come open, and the, sh the light seem to grow brighter in the room. The candles flare momentarily brighter. And in that flare of light, the shadow form of your mother returns to the bow. And I think that's where we're going to end this session. Without Griveth, without Scotty actually being here, um, we'll save uh, a little bit of RP between uh, the Dawnbringer and, um, and Griveth sort of internally in this last moments of this ritual. Um, but uh, I've instructed Scotty that he must watch this VOD. <laughs> <laughs> um 
So, with that, thank you so friggin' much, Kai. That was awesome. It was worth the wait of the first half of the of thank the session. You. That was fantastic. I I asked Kai what like three or four days. Well, I asked you a week ago, I think, but didn't even get back to you until like three or four days ago. Um, and I literally said, "Hey." do you want to play a sentient sword? <laughs> <laughs> and to her credit, Kai did not hesitate and said, absolutely. <laughs> and then I gave her some very basic guidelines and gave her complete artistic license to create the scene how she wanted to. And you just nailed it. That was just so perfect. And I love the way that you portrayed the Dawnbringer. She, the, fem the, the spirit of Dawnbringer, which is described as being a female spirit, comes across as um, very hesitant, but very strong-willed um, and a very formidable force for the will that is Griffith Langsmore. <laughs> so uh, that will be awesome. Just, again, thank you so much. That thank was you for a, having me. That was phenomenal. That was our second time that Kai and I've gotten to play together. We played in Satine Phoenix's, uh, a game I ran for Satine's, uh, celebrity charity and D back in December. I think, uh, we got to run an Eberron game written by the creator of Eberron himself, uh, which was phenomenal. Um, but it was a quick two hours. I think we only actually got to play for like an hour and 40 minutes. So, yeah. um, we will definitely be asking Kai to come back in a more <laughs> traditional character in in uh in later episodes of the Dawnbringers. Um but you are always welcome at Mini Terrain Domain. Thank and you. you can Thank catch you for having me. Sunday nights. Just so Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that place I am with a V. <laughs> uh, you know, we kind of do something on Sundays. <laughs> mm -hmm. And a huge thank you of course to to uh V and Ted and dan and jeremy um just for you know it's it's awesome to have players that i can trust that i don't need to worry about you know what we're going to do when when all of a sudden the spotlight's shown on a particular character um we got to rp some stuff at the beginning just to kind of figure out what what they're doing what their actions are and then sort of move into this this very narrative piece um and this is one of those rare cases where uh, I never even touched the, none of us touched the diet, a die tonight. Um, but believe me, if you've been watching the Dawnbringers, they were happy to not touch their dice after the last six sessions, <laughs> the last six sessions over which two days occurred or which occurred over two, two in-game days. Um, so, uh, with that, um, because I think this was still, this was the evening of the day that you all fought the, um, you actually destroyed the memory thief. Uh, so you can go ahead and take a long rest. Um, there is a really good chance that the next session, session 26, will be our season finale. Um there's also a chance we could go two more episodes. Um, I will be talking with the Dawnbringers, uh, just getting a sense of everybody's schedule and seeing what we've got coming up over the uh, next few weeks. I'm not even, if it is the season finale, we're not playing until uh, we have everybody here. Um, but we already have, I've shown the players, I've already cut together the intro piece for season four and i will tell you i think i announced it last week as well season four of the Dawnbringers will be called uh heart of the night fang spire um and they are going to be heading back across the sea back to faerun and the sword coast uh because rumors of gothias's rise into some sort of power um and the strong connections to cantriel's family um are driving them uh, and, uh, so we'll, we'll most likely within that next session, it'll be very much about, uh, figuring out how to pilot a ship and <laughs> getting the crew together and, and setting sail across the sea. Uh, so, um, I hope you all had fun tonight. I know I did. I had a blast. And again, Kai, uh, it was just awesome having you here. 
Um, huge, just just massive thank you to our chat tonight. Uh, I love seeing the chat. So I can't always keep an eye on what's happening, uh, but I love seeing it just constantly going by. And I, I know there are people in there. Our resident concierge, Tomiko, is in there. Um, making sure everybody's got drinks and and uh, is got a nice cozy blanket and, and in some cases subscriptions, uh, whatever it may be, um, as well as many others and lots of new faces tonight. Um, I know I know Kai, you seem to have brought a bit of a fan base tonight. So uh, I see a lot of new people following the channel tonight and subscriptions and all that stuff. So if you like what you see. Hit that uh, heart icon, follow the channel, and turn on the notifications to know see when we go live. Uh, here on Mini Terrain Domain, we stream on Sunday nights with our Tomb of Annihilation campaign, on Monday nights with our All That Glitters Waterdeep Dragon Heist campaign. Every other Tuesday night, we're running Legends and Legacies, The Tales of Fandelver, uh, which I'm very excited. Last, It's this coming Tuesday, and the last Tuesday um, that we played, my son, Zachary, uh joined our campaign and is now a regular member of that cast as well um and then on alternate tuesdays i can be found over on the dice on ice uh rpg stream on youtube playing curse of strad uh, once a month on wednesdays last night we had just one of the most emotional rp heavy it is i'm not ashamed to say it it is the first time an RP session between with one of my characters actually brought me to tears. Um, and part of it was, we were saying goodbye to a player who had to leave the campaign, but in game, the way that was handled was a beautiful moment. Um, and you're doing yourself a disservice. If you don't check out momentum whispers and fragments or any of Jeremy's other games over on Erasmus expeditions. Um, and then uh, of course, Thursdays, Dawnbringers. Fridays, um, I don't think I'm going to be doing one tomorrow night because uh, I got something I'm working on that I can't uh, do a live stream for. But um, occasional Friday nights, we have um, Just Crafting over on YouTube, a uh, live crafting stream. And um, one Friday a month, V and I can be found over on Nerdarchy uh, under the DMing wiles of Ted for the RPG Crate game. So as you can see, there's a ton of D&D &D happening in and around these parts, not to mention all of the wonderful things that these people are doing on their own channels. Um, be sure to follow uh, all of these wonderful people on, on social media. And if you aren't already, you need to, over here, you need to be following uh, Stonefly Kai on Twitter. Um, she is truly, uh, in my opinion, and I think many people share this, she is one of the lights of the RPG community um in that i've seen um and i'm glad to have you on the channel here so all You're right makes me blush and cry <laughs> at the same time well that's true <laughs> good thing the lights are so bright <laughs> right <laughs> so with that we are going to end the stream the same way we end every stream and you can say it with me if you want Matilda. <laughs> Heh <laughs>